<laughs> that's that's payback, huh? <laughs> I know what you're doing, man. <laughs> Give my African queen a big hand clap. Yes, I know it's right. Black power. Black power. Black people all the time. I am so happy every time I come here, man. It's so good because, you know, when you're in the belly of the beast and you're around all of that mess, it's good to come here and be refreshed. Mm -hmm. So I just want to start off by saying we do have a program with WBAI. They called us up. That's a very popular progressive station in New York. So we'll be on every Friday from 5 to 6 on WBAI. Right on. <clears throat> so I just wanted to give you... The uh, we we had a hot one. Our first program, man, was off the hook. Talk about the Negro. Oh my God! We, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna give you a little taste of the promo. This is the promo we did. One minute promo for our program. Mm This is Charles Barron, the co-host of Speaking Truth to Power with my beautiful African queen, Inez Barron. We are going to be kicking it off April 12th from 5 to 6 p.m. every Friday on WBAI. You want to listen to this program because we're going to bring the fire. We're going to bring the truth. All of the traders, the sellouts, you better be trembling in your boots because we are going to expose the truth. We're going to bring a black radical revolutionary perspective to politics and economics and the social issues of our time. Speaking truth to power will be an unbossed uncompromised, unchained voice of the community of revolutionaries, radicals, and the common brother and sister off the block. So make sure you tune in April 12th from 5 to 6 p.m. every Friday on WBAI 99.5 on your FM dial. And believe me, we're going to bring it. And we're going to bring it strong. That, that was our promo. They played that a thousand times. And we brought it, man. When we, we talked about Hakeem Jeffries, how he said, Israel today, Israel tomorrow, Israel forever. And they got calls up. People were calling them all kinds of names. Hit Eric Adams. And, you know, Tish James, the one they're giving all of this uh, popular attention to because she's taking on Donald Trump. She put Jalil Montague back in prison. It was the Attorney General, Tish James, a white judge, said that he should be released. It's been 40 some odd years. He could catch COVID. So the white judge released him. Tish, as Attorney General, she appealed it, and he had to stay in and actually caught COVID. And thank God he was all right. But I have to give the State Assembly a little credit here. I went before them, and they sent a letter to the parole board on behalf of 63 members of the Black, Latino, and Hispanic Caucus, and he was released. So I give them credit for that. So it was Herman Bell. And I wanted to get into my part of the presentation is just to talk about the accomplishments and what you should do after you're elected, when you get in. And Inez is going to talk more about how you get in, how you can get in. Because, see, too often we get people in, and after they get in, that's the challenge. And that's why, uh, Chairman, you were correct that we first have to do the ideology, keep people up on the issues, up on the platform. It's not enough just to learn how to win an election. Because if you just learn that, then, you know, anybody can get elected and then we'll have problems. So, you know, the first thing we have to do is once you get in, that's the challenge. Inez and I were alone. We were in the belly of the beast. There were 51 council members, two black radicals, sister from Harlem and myself, 150 state assembly people, just me and just Inez when she was up there because we weren't up there together. We had to stand 
you know, alone on that. And you have to take on a mayor, a governor, the powers that be that everybody is sucking up to. So for our first vocabulary word for our program, got this from the chairman, the vocabulary word of the day on our program, we'll give you a tape of it, was sycophants. <laughs> sycophants. So I told, I told people, today's show is going to be about, about neo-colonialists and sycophants. So S-Y-C-O-P-H-A-N-T, a sycophant. So they said, what's a sycophant? That's so one who sucks up to people in power in order for personal gain. A sycophant kisses parts of the anatomy that they ought not be kissing, should be kicking. A sycophant is a sellout. You should have heard the callers, those coon sycophants. <laughs> So everybody's talking in New York about sycophants. Right <laughs> but it is important to understand what we've accomplished when we got in. We took the chairman on a tour of East New York because, you know, we say it a lot. And I'll show you, you know, some little clips. Right yeah. But we took him on a tour. We were on a panel in Newark with Rasparak and, and others yeah. and about maybe 10 people from across the country talking about gentrification. <laughs> Every one of them yeah. talked about the problem of gentrification. I said, oh, I should have put that clip up too. I have a clip on what I said. Yeah, I said, we stopped it. So what y'all talking about is a problem. We stopped it. So on the real side, when I came into City Hall, my district was 65% Black and about 19% Latino. 20 years later, my district is 67% Black and 23% Latino. We are 90% Black and Latino, and we were... 9% white when I came in, we're down to 3.5% white. They left, Chairman. I had nothing to do with it. They left on their own. And some people said, wait a minute, Charles, you talking all that stuff. I saw some white people on the number three train in East New York. Yes, they were passing through. They were visiting and then they were leaving. So we literally, stopped gentrification. Major compliment. Right but the way we did it, power. Yeah. Chairman, you always say it. Yeah. Power is the great equalizer. Yeah. Power. Anybody that wants to build anything on city-owned property in our district, they have to come see the Black Panther. <laughs> Literally. Because I don't have to go to the mayor. The mayor can't give them the property. The governor can't give them the property. The speaker of the city council can't give them the property or approve the project. The council member, the local council member, all I had to do was call up the zoning committee, which is about seven people. Matter of fact, the chairman of the zoning committee is going to call me. Uh, Brother Baron, you want LU 346? It's in your district. No, sir. It's dead. No protest. Yeah. No press conference. It's dead. If Donald Trump wanted to build Trump Towers on Alabama Avenue in my beloved East New York, he has to come see me. <laughs> and if I tell the committee I don't want it, they give deference to the local council member, the project is dead. Yeah. We stop gentrification and we stop Walmart from yeah. coming into our district. Yeah. And see, that's the power of the city council. So we stop gentrification. We freed political prisoners. Yes, sir. We were able to get Herman Bell free. Yes, sir. 47 years. That's right. Herman was free, Jalil and Seth Hayes. He made his transition. And that by putting pressure on the parole board, and we knew them, and they got them out. Reparations bill, the chairman talked about it. That's our bill. Yeah. The one that Hulk will pass, but look at these sycophants. We had yeah. some yeah. sycophants 
Oh man, Senator James Sanders and Senator Comrie, my bill said, and Cam was a part of that, my bill said we want to have the community organizations pick the commission, not the state. So had it all written out, did all the history, three from and Cobra, three from the Institute of the Black World, you know, three from December 12th. I got it passed. It was passed in the State Assembly. We got 25 to do it in the Senate, and here comes the sycophants. Yeah. They got up and they said, no, no, we need to stop that bill because we don't want D12 selecting anybody. And they had the nerve to change just that part of the bill. So now Governor Hochul, who knows nothing about us or reparations, has three selections, three for the assembly, three for the Senate. That's what they passed. But it's our bill, and we're taking credit for it anyway. So we're going to do a movement beside that, a millions for reparations. We're going to have our own commission, our own people's hearings, and then we'll send that to the state to take right care on. of that. Right they talk about crime, can you put the crime stats up? Now the crime went down since we've been in office. We've been in office for 21 years, and I'll tell you about that transition. 21 years, I'm gonna show you some stats where crime actually went down in every category. Why? Because we focused on why people commit crime. They don't have no gigs. We got 6,000 jobs. They don't have no social institutions. We got a youth center, a community center, $20 million, and hired young people to run it. Man Up Inc., you met Man Up yeah, Chairman, and yeah, yeah. oh, you was at that community center. Yeah, yeah. They, they, the they run the whole center. Yeah. So look at this. From this point here, you see all of the, uh, bring it up here so I can get Take this. Take the mic with you. Right. They can't hear you over the internet. Take the silver one. Could it reach? You see where you see where it all says the minuses? Yeah. All of those areas from twenty from two oh one to twenty twenty one. This column here, all the minuses is how crime went down in every category. That 201 to 21, that's our tenureship. Crime went down in every, every area. These are some of the accomplishments. Then affordable housing. We are the only district that 100% affordability for the people in our district. No developer can come into my side of East New York and not have the area median income, the AMI, has to be our AMI. You see, you know what they do? When the developers come into your district, every time you hear the word affordability, affordable to who? Affordable, and how are you defining affordability? So the area median income, a developer sat with me and he said, uh, you know, we're going to have, uh, you and I, we're going to do affordable housing. And he took out the fancy pictures on how the house is going to look when it's finished and said, put them away. Put the pictures away. You know, how do you, what's the AMI? He said, excuse me? What is the AMI requirement? HUD, the feds, define AMI as 80% of New York City's AMI, they say is affordable for my district. So I asked the developer, do you know New York City's AMI? He said, I'm not sure. Well, let me tell you what it is. New York City's AMI is $127,000 for a family of three. 80% of that is $93,000. He said, wow, okay. I said, now, do you know my neighborhood AMI? He said, no, I don't. This meeting's terminated. Right. He said, why? 
You insulted my intelligence. You came in here and said you're building affordable housing for my neighborhood, and you don't even know the AMI for my neighborhood? He said, wait a minute, I can get it. It'll take him three minutes. I made him wait three weeks. He came back and said, now what's the AMI for my neighborhood? $36,000 for a family of three. I said, now let me tell you how this project is going to be done. 60% is going to be those making $25,000 and $35,000 a year. The other 20% is going to be those making $45,000 and $50,000. The last 10, 20% for those we know might make $80,000, $90,000. That's how it's going to be. He said, okay, oh, could you sign on it now? I said, no, sir. He said, what now? So, what's the rent going to be? And how many studio apartments are you building? See, don't let them come in your neighborhood and have 100 units and 80 of them are studios. Right. We got three and four people in our family, five and six, you know. We don't have a, we don't have a bunch of single family. They do studios because they make more money. Yeah. Yeah. Off a studio. So I said, no, we're not doing we're not doing uh, 80 studios. He said, how many do you think? I said, about 10, 15. Mm -hmm. That's all. He said, all right, all right. I said, well, what's the rent for the studio? He said, 1500 I said, no, sir, 500 right. Then he said, well, what about the one-bedroom apartments? He said, I was going to do 2500 I said, no, sir, 700 to 900 yeah. I said, what about the two bedrooms? Said, I was thinking about 35 No, sir. We're talking about fourteen to fifteen hundred. Nowhere in New York yeah. did you get a, a two, right. three That's bedroom right. apartment That's for fifteen hundred dollars. <laughs> but come on to East New York because that's what we have in East New York. That kind of rent. He said to me, he said, "Then, well, if I do that, how do I make anything?" I said, "I'm not here to help you make money. I don't care if you don't make a dime off this." He said, but uh, how can I afford it? He said, get your well. I said, get your welfare. He said, welfare? I said, yeah, when you when we get free money from the government, it's welfare. Yeah. When you get it, it's subsidies. Yeah. So either we're all on subsidies or we're all on welfare. So go get your welfare. You're going to get, I already read his portfolio. You're getting $60,000 per unit. You wanted to make $15 million off this project, but you're not. Yeah. You're going to make $3 million. And that's how we're going to keep it affordable. So that's how we were able to keep our neighborhood from being gentrified. Because now there is not a single market rate apartment out of the 30,000 that we put together. Not a single one on my side of town. bed -Stuy, Harlem, all of those areas gentrified. Mm -hmm. The mayor called up Inez because the governor's sister wanted to build. She, they already have the homeless shelters. They had like four blocks of homeless shelters, two story high, 200 people in it, a little yard in the middle. They wanted to, they wanted to <laughs> knock down all of that, build a 10 story shelter on one block and 300 units of affordable housing defined by them for the rest and put the people in a new shelter 10 stories high instead of around four blocks. Mayor came in and he said, uh, I, I really need this project. What do you need for your community? I'll give y'all whatever y'all need. You need a park or something? We say, yo, Bill, we don't roll like that. We don't roll like that, you know. We're not doing a shelter. So Inez and I said, this is what we want. 500 units, as we define affordability, take those brothers and sisters out of the shelter, give them some subsidies, some rent subsidies money, and put 200 that's in those shelters, put 200 of them in the affordable housing units that you can build on that spot. He said, well, well, you know, that's not going to happen. He left on Friday. Monday morning, they called Inez up and said, I don't know what y'all said, but they're not building 
a shelter and they're building 500 units and the 200 people in the shelters are in permanent housing. And that's what every elected official can do because they got the power to do that. We've gotten over three to 400 people out of shelters into permanent housing. Yeah. Food pantries. Yeah. We we're a food desert. We we have millions of dollars in food pantries. I don't want to sound like the gangsters, Nikki Barnes and them, but we gave out a lot of turkeys. We gave out a whole lot of turkeys, about 5,000 turkeys. <laughs> so we did all of that. Also, um, we got 6,000 jobs, the food pantries. And we got $50 million worth of scholarships for CUNY students so they can go to schools. I can finish the rest of this doing that. But I also want to show you so I can let Inez get on and keep it moving. But we want to show you what you should say on in my departing speech to the city council. By the way, we beat the most powerful machine in all of America. The Democratic Party machine in Kings County, Brooklyn, is the most powerful machine in the country. We beat them for 21 years, <laughs> 21 years. And that is Hakeem Jeffries, yeah. uh, Mayor Adams, yeah. Tish, all of them were against us for 21 years. We beat them. This last election, I didn't want to run anymore, so they got that seat back. For me, Everybody thought I was going to beat this guy because we beat him three times with the machine. They stayed home. So they got 3,000 votes. The last time I ran two years ago for that same seat, 15,000 people came out. I got 8,000. They got three, 4,000. This time, only 6,000 people came out, mm -hmm. and they got their 3,000 out, and I got 2,600. But hey, as the chairman said, puts us on another level right to on. do even some greater things. So right that's that. And this was my closing speech, and then I'll kick it to Inez. This was my closing speech at the city council. Listen to, if it plays to the end, listen to the white uh, guy who, who chairs the meeting says, any discrimination against sick New Yorkers? Will all those in favor please say aye? All opposed say nay. Any abstentions? The ayes have it. We will now move into today's general discussion. We have four individuals signed up. We will first hear from Council Member Charles Barron. Uh, thank you very much, my colleagues. You know, I heard a lot in these chambers, but today, the first time I've ever heard anyone say that we are making jails vacation homes for criminals, I suggest that you go on vacation <laughs> and, 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 and check it out for yourself, for yourself. My colleagues, this is my last talk with you. Hey, hey, wait, I don't know what that clap means. Wait a minute. I want to see some tears. Don't be clapping. This is my last speech with you, but I came here as a black, radical, revolutionary, black power advocate socialist. That's what I am. I'm anti-imperialist wars. I'm anti-capitalism. That's what I am. And so when I come here, I have to be true to who I am. So when you see some of my votes go a certain way, it's because it doesn't align with my principles, and I don't want to be overly pragmatic. There's always a challenge between pragmatism and principles, and you have to be very aware of crossing that line and rationalizing pragmatism and violating your principles. So I want to come before you this last time. Be strong. Be powerful. Keep your spine straight. Speak your conscience and speak for your people because we are dying and suffering. This is the most powerful. I ask that you extend, but don't interrupt me the last time. Go ahead. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just had to check because I'm getting on a roll here. So <laughs> Our people are counting on you. You have the power. Adam Clayton Powell 
was the first black city council member. He said, use what's in your hands. You got the power in your hands to pass budgets that are for the people, to pass budgets that really deal with poverty and unemployment. We should not be passing development projects that are not 60 to 80 percent affordable for our people. This is the most powerful council in the world. And it's in your hands to say to our people, we're going to take care of our retirees. They deserve it. We're going to take care of the least of these in our communities that are in poverty. There's enough money in a hundred and next year, $10 billion budget, $8 billion reserve to take care of poverty in black and brown districts. There's never been an allocation dealing with poverty on a real level. So I came here to use power. And as I told you when I first came in, there's a difference between power and influence. When you have to scream, holler, demonstrate to get people in power to make a decision in your best interest, that's influence. When you have the power to pass a budget and people have to use influence on you to get you to vote a certain way, you are not using your power in the best interest of our people. So as I leave, you will hear from me again, trust me. <laughs> trust me, matter of fact, I'm gonna be so bad, bad means good white folk in our community. <laughs> I'm gonna be a bad black man out there organizing. Y'all are gonna campaign for me to come back in here. <laughs> That's how bad I'm gonna be. And the speaker's gonna leave the drive. <laughs> it's gonna leave the drive. So I wanna say to my beloved East New York community, I thank you for your support over the years. And I thank you for helping us secure three $88 million schools in our district, renovated over $106 million worth of park renovations. We have a new library coming in our district built from the ground up and changed the name of one of our parks from Skank Park, a slaveholder, to Sankofa Park, a liberating name. So we were able to do that, $50 million worth of scholarships for CUNY students, and looking at all of the jobs we created. See, a lot of people think I'm just taking on governors and mayors and talking all of that stuff, but we delivered in East New York. And I could not have done this without my beloved African queen, Inez Barron. <laughs> Inez Barron. Uh, she had to go. She was here earlier with my grandchildren, so I just wanted to leave that with y'all. Come on, y'all, use your power. Use your power for our people. I'll be back, and I'm going to come back stronger than ever. So I just want to say I thank you for what? I'm trying to think. No, I thank you. <laughs> I thank you for the things that you did do. There are some progressive things that did happen. Give credit where credit is due. But we can do so, so much more. So as I leave on my last day, I want to continue to say to you, black power. Black power. And with that, I drop the mic. <laughs> Listen to this white guy. Thank you for the hours of entertainment you've also provided me, Councilman Mario. I'll now call so wait, on wait, Council Member Velasquez. Wait, typical white man calling my intellectualism entertainment. Oh, no, no, come on. <laughs> I don't think that's uncalled for, but we're calling out Council Member Velasquez. That's what you said. Well, I, during my two year tenure. That's it. And with the help of. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I'm going to kick it to Inez now. Oh, one last thing. My, um, my attire, 
when I went to the state assembly, they said, you have to wear a shirt and tie. Now, all you brothers and that wear shirts and ties, you look good. I ain't getting on you. Malcolm wore a shirt and ties, so don't feel bad. But I said, I don't wear shirts and ties. They said, but that's the decorum of the state assembly. You cannot sit in your seat without a shirt and tie. Now, why don't you wear one? I said, because I'm, I'm not European. So he said, what are you? I said, I'm African. He said, you're from Africa? I said, yeah, you stole me and brought me here. Yeah. yeah. I said, I'm African. I, I don't wear shirts and ties. I wear, you know, collarless suits and, and this and stuff. But they said, well, you're going to have to wear a, a shirt and tie. I said, okay, I'll see you. I'll see you on, the, on my, my first day. Because I ain't wearing no shirt and tie. They had a whole meeting. The governor, the on my dress. What are we going to do about a shirt and tie? So I came up there, had my little gray Nehru suit on and everything. And I said, they said, oh, 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 uh, uh, the speaker said that you're, 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 you're in compliance because they saw a section in there where, where you, you, you could dress the way you dress. I said, excuse me, sat down. I was the first male ever in the New York State Assembly to come there without a shirt and tie. <laughs> No ties to the system and no ties around my neck. <laughs>